Thank you very much. It is a privilege to be here with you today. I really would like to begin by thanking the leadership of this group. The level of organization, uh, knowledge, and commitment is, is, has been really um, eye-opening for me. This group really should be very grateful to have leaders like this. Um, I've had numerous interactions, especially with, with Nancy and with Rita, during the course of this preparation. I think you have seen the objectives on the handouts that came through, but I'm going to review those for you. I want to um, also ask for some help from the audience. And uh, this is being videotaped, so I would like someone to hold the smile sign for me. Thank you. And I need someone to hold the slow down sign because I have a tendency to talk really fast. And I know that in the end, it's better for you to understand part of the talk fully than hear the whole talk and not get any of it because I've talked too fast. OK? Are you supposed to hold this up at the same time? Uh, whenever I'm not smiling or whenever I'm talking too fast, you guys are in charge. Give me the cues. Oh, so we can sit down and just... Yes. Oh, oh right, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not expecting you to stand up there all the time. Thank you. I, I need to be clear, don't I? But, but isn't that Nancy? She would want to know exactly how it's to be done. So, okay. So you know who I am. These are our program objectives. And you'll see that I'm going to talk about the individual differences that, uh, that we see among sleepers. We're going to talk about what pushes us to sleep, how the architecture of sleep is actually structured. We're going to look at the consequences of limited sleep, and I know some of you know those consequences better than you would like to. We'll consider the options for sleep hygiene and fatigue management, and I'm going to confess right now that these options are for the most part developed for folks who are not uh, suffering from uh, chronic fatigue. Um, so I'm going to tell you what we expect people who are not suffering from chronic fatigue to do to improve their sleep, recognizing that whatever you can do to support your sleep as a baseline is going to be helpful. We have a lot more to learn about uh, sleep in CFIDS, ME, and FM. And then finally, we'll finish the program by uh, addressing questions. This is a Luna moth on a screen in the country where there's very little ambient light. And what you see is this moth is being drawn to the light. This moth has evolved with diurnal rhythms, with day-night rhythms. And so, in fact, have we. But unfortunately, we are in the middle of a natural experiment for human beings. This photograph is, uh, is, is not a joke. This is a real store in my town, open 24 hours. Notice the clock says 24 at every. So um, it, it makes sense in Cambridge that they would expect you to live like this. So we have an, uh, electric lights. We have a culture of overwork. We have 24-7 technology. Many of us are forced to sit down more of the day than we would like, often in front of computer screens. We have a cafe on every corner. In case we should feel a little bit tired, we can tank up on coffee and maybe pick up some croissants or brownies while we're there with all these tempting excess calories. And then on top of that, limited sleep. So what are the drives that are being affected by our changing lifestyle, by this natural experiment we've undertaken where we don't have uh, the normal exposure to circadian rhythms? I mean, there was a time when it got dark, people went to sleep because there really wasn't much else you could do, right? Now, instead, we're letting our homeostatic drive for sleep, which is the drive that increases the longer we're awake accumulate. So the longer you're awake, the greater your homeostatic drive to sleep. The other biological push for sleep is the circadian drive, the night-day um, dark light drive. Now, 
this uh, is a 24-hour cycle in which, when it's brighter, we're more alert. So many of you probably had the experience where you stayed up all night for a project and you were exhausted around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. But around 8, you got just a little bit of a burst of energy and you thought, this isn't too bad, right? What was really happening was there was a little bit of overlay of this circadian drive fooling you into believing that you, know, you were going to get away with not sleeping. But by that afternoon, you're not doing very well. So all of us are run by these two drives. There are individual differences between us. And we call those differences when it comes to sleeping chronotypes. The chronotypes are described as eveningness and morningness. And this is our biological proclivity to prefer to get up early and go to bed early versus get up late, go to bed late. So here we have two young men. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman on the left we call Mr. Blackshirt. He is a horror movie screenwriter in Los Angeles. He, as you can imagine, is an, an evening person. We call these people owls. He likes to uh, stay up late and get up late, and he has a lifestyle uh, for which he's well adapted because that's what they do in the movie industry in LA. Mr. Whiteshirt, on the other hand, is a criminal prosecutor in Massachusetts. He has small children. He gets up early and goes to bed early. He has to be in court early in the morning. So there is some discussion about whether or not these biological proclivities are actually genetic. And a lot of research is being done to try to understand that. One thing I can tell you, though, in terms of DNA, both of these young men are my sons. So here we have Mr. Blackshirt. Um, why do you think he ends up staying up so late? Here he is in the dark with the computer screen glowing into his face. And one of the things you'll see in the tip sheet that I gave you is a warning that a computer screen or an iPad screen, anything that's bright, LED backing, uh, is alerting, especially uh, those that have a lot of blue spectrum. So you might be feeling tired and then saying to yourself, I think I'll just check my email before I go to bed. And then suddenly this email that was boring at dinner time is interesting. But it isn't really interesting. It's just that the light from the screen is re-alerting you, blocking your melatonin. and and keeping you from uh, going to sleep when you should be going to sleep. So don't do what Mr. Blackshirt does, because you probably have to get up earlier than he does. This chart is called a hypnogram. And what you're looking at here is the sleep cycles across the night. So if you begin on the bottom left, you see the first cycle of sleep beginning at bedtime. Let's call it 11 PM. And then continuous 90-minute cycles going through to the morning. If you look from the top of the chart on the left to the bottom, what you see is deepening sleep, beginning with wakefulness, and then going down through REM dream sleep and through non-REM sleep into the deepest sleep. This sleep architecture chart, or hypnogram, is actually color-coded. And that allows you to see how the cycles, the proportion of uh, sleep stages in the cycles varies during the night. So in the first cycle, what do you see? That red trough there. That tells us that when we first go to sleep, that's when we're likely to get our deepest sleep. And as we work our way to the morning, working our way over there to 6 AM, you see a greater proportion of that cycle is dream sleep. This is what accounts for the fact that when you are aroused in the morning by the garbage truck coming by, you're in the middle of a dream that you wish you could finish, because that's when, you're, when you have the greatest proportion of dream sleep. When we study dreaming, one of the things we look at is whether there is a disturbance in this natural architecture. Long ago, before the invention of the EEG in 1929, it was believed that 
when we went to sleep, the brain kind of shut off. There was no more interaction with the outside world, no more sensory input coming in. And it was believed that this was kind of a you know, din, dead zone period. But then, with the discovery of the EEG, it was found that the brain is, in, in fact, incredibly active during the night. So uh, we had to really rethink. It was, you know, I often say being in the sleep field is like being an astronaut. We're discovering new things every day. So among the interesting discoveries, uh, during um, dream sleep, we have muscle paralysis. That is, literally, we're, we're not moving when we're sleeping. And there's a reason for that, because if, if we could move, we might very well be getting up and acting on our dreams. And in fact, there are disorders in which people do move around in their sleep. Um, but under normal circumstances, we're not moving while we're dreaming. Uh, we've also begun to understand by depriving people of different stages of sleep that the different stages may be serving different purposes in terms of what they help us with uh, in, in restoring us after a, a day. Uh, are they helping us with physical skills? Are they helping us with memory? Um, practice the piano before you go to bed. And then well, when you wake up, go back to the piano, you may very well discover that you are playing better than when you went to sleep. Because sleep has a consolidating um, effect on us and, and enhances our learning. So also then uh, at the bottom of this slide, sleep does produce positive effects in problem solving, creativity, integration, and extraction such that um, I, you know, I at one point was speaking to uh, folks at MIT, and you know they're uh, very concerned about their creative output and their efficiency, and they don't like to give up time in which they could which they could be using for innovation. But the data actually suggests that well-slept people are much more likely to produce a creative algorithm, a creative solution, than than people who are struggling uh, without having slept enough. And I think they found that very convincing. It is most efficient to give some of your time to sleep. It's hard to believe this, but most of us, when we were born, were sleeping 18 hours a day, half the time in dream sleep, right? Flash forward, and what you see is as we age, our sleep is shorter and lighter. So again, looking at this chart, on the far left of the chart, we're talking about a five-year-old. And if you look at a five-year-old sleep, you see that they have a larger amount of sleep as measured in minutes up the left side of this chart than the 85-year-old on the far right. But there are also differences in the proportion of sleep stages. So the very top line is, is the line that represents sleep latency. Sleep latency is how long it takes you to fall asleep. And in fact, CFIDS FM folks often complain that they get into bed and don't fall asleep as quickly as they would like. They, they have uh, complaints of extended sleep latency. But typically, sleep latency doesn't change much with aging. What does change is what we call WASO, or wake after sleep onset. And that's this second row. So you see that a five-year-old is rarely awakening during the night. But by the time you're 85, you're waking up. So one of the challenges then as we age is when we wake up, how we handle that, and how we help ourselves then get back to sleep, right? The next, uh, the next is REM, or dream sleep. Decreases somewhat with aging. But the big decrease here we see in this dark band is slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep is a deep restorative sleep. I believe that if we could find the 
the clue to increasing our slow wave sleep, we would find a fountain of youth. Stage two sleep is, uh, is not dream sleep, but it's not the deepest sleep. And stage two sleep uh, is again characterized, as are all these stages, by particular kinds of brain waves. When you get a, uh, a sleep test in a laboratory with an EEG, what they're looking for is the signature brain waves from each of these uh, stages of sleep. And on the bottom, stage one is when you're just drifting off. I want you to know when I was seen photographing this window, the people in the store ran out and draped clothes over the, over the models. Um, I, I don't know what they thought I was going to do with the picture, but here it is. <laughs> um, and I, I chose this to represent cyclic variations in sleep needs and quality. And women in particular experience this with changes in the menstrual cycle. Many people will say right before they get their period, they have a particularly difficult time sleeping. And of course, if there are symptoms related to this lack of sleep, they may vary in parallel with the cycle. So by adulthood, as we said, sleep, uh, deep sleep diminishes by uh, about 20, by uh, half from ages 20 to 30, and then further by 40 and going forward. Um, but what else happens that gets in the way of our sleep as we become adults? First of all, we often have less opportunity for self-care. We have additional family and work responsibilities. The incidence of sleep disorders increases. And then, as we work our way uh, from the 40s into the 50s, for women, menopause is often a challenge in terms of disrupted sleep. With illness and aging, we find additional issues. First, with retirement or illness, the daily life structure can be lost. There is no requirement to get up at a certain time, no break, specific break for lunch. So it's easy to lose a rhythm in your day. Um, sometimes if you're, if you're tired or uh, isolated, then you end up maybe being in the recliner for more of the day than you would like to. So life structure is hard to hold on to. While the time in bed, that's TIB, may increase, the total sleep time typically decreases. And the, the proportion of time in bed to total sleep time is called sleep efficiency. So we say as you age, your sleep efficiency decreases. Typically, physical activity and light exposure are sleep enhancing. And I, you know, I recognize with um, post-exertional malaise, which is common uh, among CFIDs uh, and, and FM folks, that um, it, exercise issues can be challenging, and the titration of activity has to be done with great care. But um, in the best of all worlds, physical activity and light exposure actually enhance our sleep. But if you stay in because you're you're isolated or you don't feel well, then you're not getting either of those things. Uh, we also know that pain and certain medications, prescription and over-the-counter, can affect sleep. And as we age, more sleep disorders come online. And there's some indication that the actual um, neurology of circadian rhythms can weaken with aging. This chart is designed to show you a range of influences on sleep some of which can be modified, and others which cannot. So for example, we can't do that much about our age and gender, though people have been known to try. Um, we have cultural norms and a social context, a lifestyle uh, in which we are often embedded and which can be a challenge. You talk to, to students who live in a dormitory. Uh, some of those uh, are um, larks, morning people, like Mr. Whiteshirt was. When he was in college, everybody was up late playing music and running around the dorm. Very difficult for someone with his physiology in that setting to get the sleep he needs. We talked about light and circadian drive. We will talk extensively about sleep environments. Exercise and activity level, as you know, a challenge. Sleep schedule, one of the things we understand is that consistency is helpful to the body. 
the body wants you to produce, uh, to give it an opportunity to uh, have a cycle. It, it wants to work that way. Remember, it, it, it was at one point your body um, in sync with nature. So what can you do to du duplicate that? Well, you could start by having a closely similar uh, wake up and bedtime on each day. And you know, this is very hard to do. Uh, weekends often challenge us to stay up later over social activities. And there's actually a term called social jet lag, which is what the Monday experience is like for a lot of people. On, on Monday, having stayed up late Friday night and Saturday night and tried to sleep in on Sunday, suddenly on Monday you're off schedule because you have to be up again early. So um, consistency, helpful if it can be pulled off. Bed partners and pets can be a real challenge. And you know there are, in fact, times when it's better to have your bed partner come and visit you, uh, have a date, rather than try to sleep together all night. Because if you're waking each other up because you're on different schedules or because one person moves a lot during their sleep or has breathing problems, then uh, in, they may be uh, disordering the sleep of their sleep mate. So uh, interesting to consider that. I'm guessing in this group there is not a lot of use of caffeine and, and alcohol. Alcohol is a particular problem for our CFIDS folks. Um, does not work out well at all. Um, caffeine, in fact, does increase alertness under uh, normal circumstances. And in fact, under desperate circumstances, young doctors are known to do what's called the caffeine nap, which is you drink a strong cup of coffee, and then you rest for 20 minutes. And when you wake up, both the nap and the caffeine have come online. So you know, in an emergency, that's one way to do it. I'm not sure I would recommend that here. And of course, uh, psychological state can affect how well we're sleeping. If there's something we're worried about, I mean, let's face it, with this economy, when you go to bed, you, you really need to sort of wash your mind of some of the things that could trouble you and keep you, keep you awake. I want to thank my mother, actually, my late mother, for this drawing. This is a picture of me sleeping in my 30s, um, which she did. And you're welcome to visit her website, virtualeasel.com. If you give talks, she would like nothing more than to know that her uh, work is being shared and enjoyed. I want to talk about the, the risks of limited sleep. And I'm going to discuss that from three directions, the epidemiological, the individual physiological changes, and then what we know about altered memory and cognition. So first of all, uh, in terms of the epidemiological evidence, um, what you're looking at here is the age-adjusted percentage of adults who reported 30 days of insufficient rest or sleep during the past 30 days. That means every night for a month. And if you look at those percentages, you'll see that the darkest states, along with generally being Republican, also have the least sleep. And I don't know how we make sense of that exactly. But it's pretty stunning. And if you look up, Massachusetts is not doing as well as we might like, is it? Um, uh, recognize that the people who seem to be at most risk for insufficient sleep seem to be two groups. One, the under-resourced, who may be forced to live in noisy environments and crowded quarters, you know, maybe uh, working night shifts or multiple jobs. And then you know, the, the overcommitted and uh, ambitious, who may take on more than is humanly possible and, and suffer the consequences in terms of lack of sleep. So what we find, and this comes from the CDC, are intersecting epidemics here. Insufficient sleep over here on the right. But look how this parallels suffering from obesity and diabetes. And as we're beginning to understand the, uh, the physiology of insufficient sleep, this 
uh, this intersecting phenomenon makes sense. Because when you're, you have a significant sleep debt, your physiology changes in such a way that, for starters, your satiation signal drops. In other words, you eat your, and you still feel hungry. You don't feel full after you eat. And it is leptin, uh, which is a um, hormone that is signaling satiation. So leptin is dropping. Meanwhile, ghrelin, which is the hunger signal, is going up. So you're hungrier, but you don't feel full. So you're having changes in your energy balance. You have an increased appetite. Some people think, well, if they stay up more, they can just eat a couple of more meals, and that's fine. But what we discover is they don't, in fact, burn the calories, the extra calories that they eat when they're up. They gain weight instead. There's also research suggesting influences on immune cell activation and inf inflammation when folks have not had enough sleep and abnormalities in stress hormone regulation. I would say none of that looks very good, does it? And yet, this does not look so bad. <laughs> um, some of us, in fact, miscue. When we're tired, instead of heading for bed, we head for the refrigerator. And I, I have to admit to uh, some of that behavior myself. But so on top of being underslept, we have uh, you know, additional um, pushes from the society uh, around food problems. Uh, the food marketing practices with increased portion sizes, fast food availability, and then our reductions in physical activity. There was actually a recent analysis of new editions of cookbooks. And what they discovered is uh, over the past decades, they have been increasing the portion sizes in these cookbooks. So you can make the same thing your mother made in the 50s, but you'll be expected to be giving out twice, of, twice as much of it to your family members. These, uh, this, I think, is a very interesting chart. Uh, what you see here are two reciprocal graphs. The one on the top shows the rise in overweight and obesity in the United States from 1960 to 2000. And do you see how this is going up, up, up? So you're getting to the point, and I, I believe by 2013, we're above um, this uh, high 60s that you see for 2000. Meanwhile, while obesity is rising, mean hours of sleep in a practically reciprocal pattern are dropping from 1960 to 2000. So in 1960, mean sleep, 8.5 hours. That means some people are sleeping a good bit more than that, right? And in fact, there's now research that's suggesting that maybe we need closer to nine hours. We always hear, well, try to get seven, you know. But in fact, it may be that even seven is way far off the mark. Um, and we're, we're going to be learning more about that over the next years. But I think this is pretty stunning in terms of the epidemiology. So how much sleep are the pros getting? Uh, I don't know. Can you, can you see these up here at the top? Um, you see Roger Federer, 11 to 12 hours. LeBron James, 12 hours. So why are these guys sleeping so much? Well, first of all, they're getting paid to be at their physical best. They're getting paid to have their skills be at peak. This is what it takes, maybe, to do that, especially if your job includes a lot of physical activity, right? You notice in the middle there at four to five hours is Tiger Woods. And there's been some suggestion that there may be judgment issues related to lack of sleep here. We don't know what he's doing during this time when he's not sleeping. <laughs> so we talked earlier about um, memory and cognition being one of the places where we see the impact of limited sleep. So what I want to show you here is two comparison charts. The first on the left is the actual performance of folks 
with limited sleep. And you see three lines there. The top one, people with eight hours sleep. And you see, in fact, that even their actual performance is declining, which suggests perhaps two things. One, that the task gets boring after a while. But secondly, that maybe even eight hours in bed is not enough, because eight hours in bed doesn't necessarily mean eight hours of sleep, right? Because we're waking up during the night, because it takes some time for us to go to sleep. So if you think you're getting eight hours of sleep because you're in bed for eight hours, you're not. The second line down is six hours sleep, and you can see a, a decline here in their performance on an attention task. But when you look at four hours a night for two weeks, you see a really dramatic decline. Now compare this chart to the chart on the right, which is called self-rated performance. What's most stunning about this comparison chart is how little insight people have into the decrements in their performance. So the eight hour people have a pretty good idea that they maybe have declined a little in how well they're doing. But the six hour people, look at this, it starts to level off. They're getting worse, but they don't know it. And the four hour people who have had a dramatic decline have very little insight into how badly they're doing. Now imagine this guy is a truck driver and he's getting in his truck and he's driving and he doesn't understand how limited his attention is at this point. Or, or suppose this guy is, or this woman is, a resident who's taking care of you on the night shift in the hospital. It, this is, a, I think, a, a tremendously important slide because there are people who believe they can get away with not sleeping, and, or, or not sleeping very much. And it is true that some people, um, natural short sleepers, uh, and it's a very small percentage of the population, are a little bit more cognitively resilient to lack of sleep than others. But for the most part, we cannot get away with this, but we don't necessarily know it. We cannot report the decline. And on top of that, many of us who are awakened repeatedly during the night cannot report that, because your memory is not fully online when you're sleeping. So if there's a trash truck you know, going to the supermarket next to where you live all night, and you're being awakened by this, and this is the noise study that Nancy described earlier, and I'm the senior author on that study, people cannot report how often they have been awakened by noise. We can see it in their brain waves. We can see it on their heart rates. But they cannot report it themselves in the morning. So that's, uh, I think, pretty important. Let's review some of the effects of insufficient or disordered sleep. I know many of these are, um, many on this list are experiences that some of you have had. And that's one of the reasons why disordered sleep has been uh, on the radar for trying to understand the CFIDS uh, and FM experiences. Impaired attention and reaction time we talked about decreased memory and concentration. We know that with limited sleep, there's worse mood. People can become depressed. Less willingness to, to be helpful. Easier to become frustrated. Harder to complete tasks. And of course, under any of these circumstances, this can get in the way of psychosocial functioning. Risk of injuries and falls. This is particularly interesting. We see this uh, with patients in the hospital whose sleep is disturbed during the night by noise. And then when they've been awakened, they get up, they try to move around the room, and they fall. Incidence of pain and inflammation, weight gain, we talked about, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and all of these things compounding to increase the consumption of healthcare resources. This is one of the reasons why we feel sleep should be right up there on, on the top of the list with um, good food and exercise in terms of protecting the public health. Critical. So I want to talk about now some of the subjective reports of sleep changes, the things that people talk about as their experience as sleepers. You hear people saying, I have difficulty falling asleep. I have difficulty staying asleep. 
When I wake up, I can hardly believe in the morning, I can hardly believe I rested. I have unrefreshing sleep. These complaints, in fact, may be related to disordered or insufficient sleep. We recognize post-exertion malaise, fatigue interfering with functioning during the day, pain, of course, and impaired short-term memory and concentration. Many of these, these starred components, are actually part of the CDC case definition. Not a surprise. If we want to understand what's really going on in sleep, what are the tools that are open to us in studying individual sleepers and also in doing sleep research? The PSG, or polysomnogram, is the testing that is typically done when you go to a sleep laboratory, where you have an EEG, an electroencephalogram, done of your brain waves. They wire little electrodes to your head, and they watch the brain waves while you're sleeping. They also have EMGs, which are electromyograms, and EOGs, electrooculograms, and they look at muscle, uh, muscle during sleep. Recall during REM sleep, your muscles are not activated. And they also look at eye movements, because as you're, as you're falling asleep, and again during REM sleep, there are characteristic eye movements. Actigraphy is a method of studying sleep that uses an accelerometer. Essentially, you wear this device on your wrist, and this device detects your motion during sleep. Then there are formulas or algorithms which read this motion and help the uh, actigraphy device um, report uh, what your sleep looks like. And specifically, um, actigraphy is good for recording wake-ups. And those of you who have iPhones may be aware that there are actually um, uh, devices available uh, with apps that will read to your iPhone. One of them is called uh, the Lark. And this uh, device will report to you how you slept in the morning and then can even coach you on how to improve your sleep. So uh, technology is helping us with this. Most of us don't have a sleep expert in our house all the time, and some of the people who do wish they didn't. <laughs> My husband's smiling. In addition, we look at oximetry. And oximetry is a way, it's a little clip that you can put on, uh, on someone's finger that can read the oxygen in their blood supply. There are also ways of looking at respiration during sleep with a special cannula. Um, we do this because we know that in some sleep disorders, uh, breathing is affected. And when breathing is affected, oxygen can drop. And we'll talk more about those in our second half when we get to sleep disorders. We also use questionnaires, even though we know that self-report is not always the best way to understand what's going on with sleep. There are elements that we can understand um, through questionnaires. For example, how often in the past month have you found yourself falling asleep while you were driving? OK. Do you often fall asleep in front of your TV? Do you fall asleep when people are talking, um, uh, even early in the morning? And for some of you, I see the answer is yes, but don't worry, we're going to have a stretch soon. Um, we, uh, we also ask people about their morningness uh, and eveningness proclivities. And sometimes this is to guide people to find uh, lifestyles that actually match their natural proclivities instead of trying to fight those. Given we know so much, why is it so hard for us to learn more about sleep and CFIDs, ME, and FM? Why is it so difficult? Well, let me tell you what some of the challenges are as a sleep researcher. First of all, you have to choose your subjects. And you have to get people to sign up who will agree to some of the things that you want to do to them. The, the diagnostic categories can be hard to define. And in addition, 
the clinical criteria and severity can vary so that you may have someone who's not suffering too much at all whose uh, sleep study might look quite different from someone who is. And if you're going to pool the data from these subjects and they average out, then you might not learn what you would like to learn. So we need to do case studies and we need to pool data. The standard scoring period for sleep is about 30 seconds of sleep. Think about this. If, in fact, the problems are, are of a smaller scale, are, in fact, part of the sleep, what we call microstructure, they might not be showing with the kind of analysis that we're doing. In addition, if you sometimes have trouble sleeping in your own room, try sleeping in the sleep laboratory. Um, you've got to wear this stuff on your head. You've, you've got a, uh, you've, may, you've probably also got an actigraphy on. Um, by the way, you'll see that we often video the people in case you're just a little bit shy, recognizing that all night you're also going to be videoed. Um, and then there'll be a sleep technologist and sleep researcher who'll be watching you through a special window. And on top of it, it may very well be a hospital environment. When we were doing our sleep and noise research, we actually had to specially quiet down the sleep lab because the noises in the sleep lab were interfering with the patient's sleep. And who knew that? On top of it, multiple nights are expensive. So if you, if you find it hard to adjust the first night, maybe you're sleeping a little bit better after that. It costs a lot of money to have subjects sleep night after night in a sleep lab. Um, on top of it, while, you know, in the best of all possible worlds, you can isolate you know, a specific problem that you're trying to study, in real human beings, we've got lots of things going on with us. It would be nice if someone would say, if you've got CFIDs, then you don't have to have rheumatoid arthritis. But, but you know, it doesn't necessarily work that way. It's very hard to isolate a particular uh, clinical entity. And then there's our, you know, our behaviorist scientists. And I had said this to Nancy at one point on the phone, and she liked it enough that I thought I should add it. We tend to look for our lost keys under the street light because it's brighter there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's where the keys are. But that's where we look. So we have the tools to study certain things, and we keep doing that. But are, we, are the keys under the street light, or do we need to be looking, looking further into the dark? Now, let me begin with this slide with the bottom line by saying first that the findings among studies are inconsistent. A study comes out, we think, wow, so maybe this is the answer. But then maybe that study can't be duplicated. Maybe the subjects of that study are a little bit different than uh, subjects in another study. Maybe the study is so small that it doesn't have the statistical power to be convincing. So some of the suggestions about what's wrong with with uh, CFIDS, ME, and FM sleep, I can review for you. But I, but I need to begin by offering the proviso that these, uh, the findings among these studies are, in fact, inconsistent. There have been some, based on EEGs and polysomnograms, some demonstration of changes in sleep architecture. And remember, sleep architecture, remember I showed you that hypnogram that showed the stages of sleep as they proceeded through the night? So this is what we're talking about when we say there are changes in sleep architecture. We see uh, different uh, transitions in the stages. We see the stages of different lengths than we expect. We might see a distribution of different patterns, more wake up than we would anticipate, and lower sleep efficiency. And you remember sleep efficiency was time in bed versus total sleep time? Keeping those things in mind, some of the things that have been uh, discovered there, there's been reports of alpha intrusion into delta sleep. And what they're talking about there is a faster um, sleep wave. And by hertz, we're talking about the cycles per second. So you see alpha waves, faster uh, cycling waves um, that are, are more typical of being awake with your eyes closed, alpha waves, 
intruding into what should be deep, slow wave delta sleep. So that's telling us you're not getting the uh, restorative, the full restorative help that you should be getting from, from deep sleep, right? So no surprise that when this uh, alpha intrusion is discovered that there are reports of daytime sleepiness, increases in pain and depression. In fact, some people actually think that it is the um, periodic experiences of pain, perhaps with some motion during the night and so forth, that are actually correlated with the alpha intrusion. So we also have seen reports of shorter total sleep, sleep time, not surprising, uh, uh, less REM, less dream time, and more REM to waking. That means instead of REM moving into deeper sleep, that people wake up after their dreams. So that's increasing wake after sleep onset. And as, as uh, many of you nodded when we talked about this earlier, extended sleep latency, right? Prolonged sleep onset. Finally, um, in fibromyalgia, there's been uh, some indication of a decrease in a, tr a certain type of wave, and I'll show you what those waves look like in a minute. Uh, lowered spindle density, and this is a particular wave that uh, uh, comes from the thalamus through to the cortex. In our um, noise research, one of the things we discovered was that the people who slept uh, the best uh, when exposed to noises in the lab were the ones who had the most sleep spindles in stage two sleep. So if, in fact, you have decreased or limited spindles in stage two sleep, it would make sense from what we've discovered so far that you would be more arousable. And there are people now actually looking at the genetics of sleep spindles. So we should learn more about that soon. This is what a sleep spindle looks like. Literally, the, uh, the person who reads the polysomnogram, the electroencephalogram part of the polysomnogram, is coding for how often these spindles occur when the person is in stage two sleep. So biomarkers. You hear all about biomarkers. Why are we always looking for biomarkers? What good are they going to be to us? Let me give you some thoughts on why this is an important direction for research. First of all, if we can identify real biomarkers, then it will be much easier to diagnose a person. Think how long it sometimes takes for people to get a diagnosis. How many people have been run through psychotherapy and couples counseling and God knows what else before somebody has suggested, gee, you know, when we look at the onset of this and, and you know, actually look at the, the symptoms and the CDC criteria, it looks like you might in fact have CFIDS FM or ME, right? But sometimes it takes a long time. If in fact there were an actual diagnostic test, this would be a huge help for those who are just, um, you know, asking for care based on subjective report. This would help us understand the pathways and mechanisms uh, through which the symptoms are being produced. It would probably help us increase funding because it would confirm uh, that we have an actual direction for uh, organizing treatment leading to interventions. And I think importantly, and I put be, be aware of invisibility here, that um, many people have in fact had the experience of having their, their um, subjective reports invalidated. If we had biomarkers and we could test for this, people wouldn't have to suffer through that. New direction in, um, in research, and I have to hand it to Nancy for pointing me to this study, which just came out March 14th of this year. And, you know, and Nancy shoots this to me, you know, probably moments after the data was reported. This is, a, I think, a very promising direction for the research, looking at uh, changes in heart rate variability. And heart rate variability is actually the variation in the time interval between heartbeats. 
Uh, it is a measure of functioning of the sympathetic or fight or flight arm of the autonomic nervous system. There is a balancing arm, the parasympathetic arm, which is the rest and digest response. I always remember that by thinking of it as a parachute. It helps you down from being up in the air, helps you down kind of slowly. So if, in fact, um, heart rate variability is, is off here, what's happening is um, the normal changes, the normal adjustments that happen in, in heart rate change are not happening. And instead, the person is at a, uh, in a more aroused state. And I know many of you have uh, heard the term or used the term the wired tired. So you're exhausted, but you still don't necessarily feel like you can shut down. And I think that subjective experience is quite consistent with what's being reported here by Togo and Nadelson in Autonomic Neuroscience, um, March 14th. I, I find this actually a, a hopeful, uh, a very hopeful uh, finding because this is potentially a modifiable problem, uh, possibly uh, biofeedback, certain medications, pharmaceutical interventions may help with this um, uh, heart rate variability problem and may help folks cycle down from this uh, continuous fight or flight reaction that is running apparently even when people are asleep. Let's take a little bit uh, of a break now, recognizing that one direction for in which we can take control of this and lower our own arousal levels might in fact be through meditation. I love this. He's on the computer um, and he's turning all the way around looking at her and she's on her way to meditation. I wish I could get my hair to do that. I want to talk now about things that you can do to improve your own sleep. How to take control over take control back over the night. And again, as I, as I mentioned earlier, that these are not specifically designed for your group, but, but these are the directions we give to, to folks who have complaints about insufficient or disrupted sleep or who complain of excessive daytime sleepiness. The first place to look is your bedroom environment. We look at sound coming into your environment, light, temperature, humidity, safety, uh, what technology is in there, and uh, including what computer screens you're going to be exposed to. And I'm going to go back and talk about each of those a little bit, but I want to say <clears throat> I've used these, this particular slide in, in the public schools, and the teenagers love this especially the part that says sleep and sex only, if their parents are there, because they like to sort of look at me and move their eyes back and forth slowly like, Mom, did you hear that? Um, so yes, your bedroom environment. Um, ideally, you don't have lunch in bed. Um, what you want to do is condition your bed uh, only for the things that should be done in there, so that when you pop into bed, there's an immediate message, oh yeah, this is, this is part, of the, part of the wind down that goes on. In terms of noise, I talked with you a little bit earlier about our study showing that uh, noise can be disruptive of sleep, especially for people who don't have um, a significant uh, number of sleep spindles in stage two sleep. So what can you do about that? There are... Uh, air cleaning machines, for example, HEPA filter machines that will make kind of a white noise. Those will not only clean the air in your room, but they can serve uh, to some degree as masking for noises that are coming from the outside. In addition, let's face it, you may have to do some negotiation with the other people who, with, with whom you share living quarters. If, you know, if you're going to bed early and other people are staying up, they need to respect the fact that you've got to get your sleep, and you need to make a, a request of them and ask for a commitment that your sleep time matters. In terms of light, uh, 
As you know, light is arousing. That's part of what we, we saw in the circadian rhythms. So what you don't want, unless you're planning to get up at dawn, you don't want a room that the sun is going to come in and shine on you at 5.30 in the morning. So I myself have room darkening curtains so that when the sun comes up, the room doesn't get brighter. Um, this is particularly important because we have a cat. And uh, cats are crepuscular. That means they are most awake at sunrise and sunset. So if you're living with a cat, you've got to keep your room dark. Otherwise, she's going to get up and start jumping on you and meowing, saying, hi, mom, wake up, it's morning. So um, light. Temperature. Uh, I don't know exactly what the temperature is in here, but it feels about right for a sleep room. Um, mid to high 60s. Uh, hotter than that begins to get in the way of sleep. In fact, the triggers for sleep include a drop in your body temperature. So trying to sleep in a hot room is difficult. Um, uh, humidity can be important, especially if you have dry eyes or, or dry mouth as additional symptoms. Um, if you have then a, a, a dry environment, that's only going to make those problems worse. Um, safety, what do I mean by that? Uh, clear the pathway. If you're going to get up during the night, possibly, and go to the bathroom, don't have cords in the way. Don't leave slippers on the floor. Um, it might be that it makes sense for you to have a small, a very small flashlight on your night table so that you can see your way. And if you have a cat, you know, an enormous number of people end up in the emergency room because when they get up at night, they, they fall over their pets. So a clear pathway. Um, we talked a little bit earlier when I showed you the uh, picture of um, Mr. Blackshirt with his computer in bed late at night. So a lot of people think, oh, I like, I like TV at night. It helps me fall asleep. I've actually had, had one guy come to me for help because he said he liked to fall asleep with the TV, but then it woke him up all night. It kept waking him back up. Now, to me, this was like you know, hitting yourself over the head and then asking for pain medicine. I thought, well, you know, you, you've got some options here. You could start by desensitizing yourself to the TV. In other words, moving it inch by inch by inch out of the room, out of the room, right, and into the hall, or making it lower and lower and lower until it's off. Another option is just putting it on a timer, right? If it typically takes 10 to 12 minutes for you to fall asleep, put it on a timer. Then it's off, and it doesn't wake you back up. Safety TV and computer screens. And I, I think I mentioned that the light from the computer screen can block melatonin. Melatonin rises when you're falling asleep. So you don't want to block your melatonin if you want to get a good rest. There's soon to be published a very interesting study where they looked at iPads. And iPads have our, our LED backlit. And it turns out that, in fact, if you are reading an iPad for a period of time before you go to sleep, it looks like you are actually blocking your melatonin. And they discovered that folks have an um, increased sleep latency. In other words, it takes them longer to fall asleep. And they seem to have less REM sleep. Their architecture is disturbed. There are electronic. Uh, reading devices that are not backlit. I think one of them might be the Nook. But you, you don't want that kind of exposure. An ordinary book with an incandescent light shining on the book and not into your face is a much better way to go if one of your rituals for calming down at night is, uh, is reading. And uh, on the break, one, one gentleman mentioned to me that he still reads himself to sleep in the same way that his parents read to him at bedtime. And that's kind of part of a wind down routine. We'll talk about wind down routines. It's very helpful to condition yourself to kind of move into the sleep phase by, by winding down. So look at this guy's room. Um, can I have some shout outs from the audience about what's this guy doing wrong? Let's hand. Don't be shy. Everything? OK, some enumeration. He's eating. He's eating, eating pizza, yeah. TV remote. I'm sorry? The TV remote. 
He's, he's holding the TV remote. What else has he got? The computer on, right? Listening to music and co three cups of coffee. Lights are on. Lights are on. Phone. I think that's his hair, but it could be a dog. <laughs> Could be a very, a very, very furry dog. Um, yeah, so this is, you know, this is a good picture of all the things that you don't want to do, right? So all you need to do is bring this image back to mind. There's a reason why they call this sleep hygiene, if you know that before. Does this look hygienic to you? I don't think so. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like in there by morning. OK, here's his computer sleeping. That's why the screen is down. OK, so here's some more thoughts on how we can improve sleep. First of all, remember we talked about individual differences. Here we're talking about chronotype insights. What that means is know thyself. You know, If you're a morning person and you know you're going to wake up early, does it make sense for you to stay up really late the night before? Probably not, right? So, you know. Um, Respect your own uh, natural proclivities. When you are taking medications, either prescription or over-the-counter, or if you happen to be using substances, some of which are now apparently legal in Massachusetts, even caffeine, tobacco, alcohol, uh, certain decongestions, stimulants, sedatives, herbs, many of these do have effects on sleep. And you know, make it uh, among your responsibilities when you're, when you're deciding to take one, take one of these or when a doctor is prescribing this, to find out what the possible effects of sleep are. There are people who've been sleeping badly and never made the connection until someone finally reviewed their medications and said, well, no wonder. You take this at bedtime every night? We talked a little bit earlier again about exercise and light exposure. Ideally, morning light is alerting if you're, you know, when you're, when you're feeling you're most rested, uh, if you can just cruise around a little bit outside and get some of that sunlight, this is going to help uh, entrain your circadian rhythms, which is what you want. Um, and we did t also talk a little bit earlier about post-exertional malaise, so you're going to have to pace yourself in terms of exercise and activity. But even if this is just, you know, uh, a gentle walk around a couple of blocks where you're getting daylight, it's going to be good for you. Sleep schedule consistency. Consolidation, when we talk about sleep, means having your sleep periods together. So rather than sort of, you know, napping in and out, you know, in the lounge chair, in the lazy boy, watching a show, drifting back and forth, then it's bedtime and you're kind of tired but what we call your sleep pressure, which is your drive to sleep. And remember, we talked about those two different interacting drives um, earlier today. Your sleep pressure kind of gets drained off when, when you do that. And so uh, when you don't have a consolidated sleep period, you might get into bed. It might be night. And then you don't fall asleep the way you should. So if you're having a hard time falling asleep, if you have an exaggerated sleep latency, think about whether that might be getting in the way. Family night care responsibilities. If you have elderly parents or, or children or pets that need to be dealt with, get that under control as well as you can before you go to sleep. Get everything in place. Uh, my cat likes to eat at night. Um, in fact, she likes to eat all the time. So you need to keep her bowl full. If you go to sleep without filling her bowl, she is inevitably, inevitably going to jump up on you and start meowing right in your face. So get that stuff under control. Pets, partners, children. Um, sometimes this requires a little negotiation where you say, look, you know, I'll fold your socks for the rest of your life if you'll just you know, take care of this during the night, because when I'm awakened, I can't fall back asleep. I just really like this joke with the outside outsized coffee maker. They have a whole room just for the coffee. Um, it's come to that. that. This is our current lifestyle. So this is improving sleep three.
I mean, I could have gone on and on, five slides, 10, but I, you know, tried to, I tried to keep it to the three here. How many people eat late? Okay, so you eat late, and then what happens? You're kind of revved up, yeah, from eating. Then you have to clean up after that. Sometimes you're really tired, you go to sleep anyway. If you happen to have reflux, then going to bed on a full stomach is going to aggravate that. So, um, and even if, you're, even if you're going to bed, having been vertical for a while, one hint for reflux is to get yourself one of those wedged angled pillows so that gravity is helping keep the food down. Um, sometimes the simplest solutions are just mechanical solutions. So best to have sufficient vertical time after dinner. Best to have a bedtime ritual. And whether that includes reading, some people like to listen to calming music. It's best if your bedtime ritual is not get involved with a million emails. One uh, very helpful element of a wind down ritual, especially, uh, and there's research support for this now for fibromyalgia, is a, a warm to hot bath. And if you do a warm to hot bath a couple of hours before you go to sleep, what that's going to do is trigger the cooling down of your body, which is not only going to be the, the bath is going to be calming, but it's also going to help you trigger into sleep. So and a lot of people like to take a morning shower. But you know, if you, especially if you have an exaggerated sleep latency, or you think that pain might be waking, up, waking you up during the night, um, experiment with this and see if it works for you. Um, positioning in bed, as I mentioned, for pain and reflux. Uh, what do you need to do for pillows? Um, make sure that your bed clothes aren't all swirled up and, and getting in your way. I mean, all these sort of you know, simple, practical things can make a difference in how you sleep. Waso prep. Remember Waso? Wake after sleep onset. So anticipating that you're probably going to wake up. What do you want to have, possibly? What, uh, a small water bottle next to the bed? Something that won't break if you knock it over? Um, nocturia means getting up to urinate during the night, right? You could throw that around at parties. And no one will know what you're talking about. So um, again, you've got to have a clear path, right? Got to, be, got to be prepared. And if that means having a very small flashlight or a small night light that's on in the bathroom, so that you can find your way without having to throw the lights all the way on and, and wake yourself back up, be prepared. Do you need eye drops next to your bed? And is there something you can do that will help yourself fall back asleep? And if that means, again, putting back on you know, a little bit of peaceful music or doing some breathing exercises, you know, whatever helps you sort of keep worries out of your mind and distract yourself back into sleep, be prepared for that. Now, if you, you know, if you discover that your, despite all your efforts, that your sleep is, is really um, way out of control, and it goes beyond, and especially if you feel that it's getting worse, um, this is a time when you want to, uh, you know, approach your primary care doctor and describe some of the circumstances and, and advocate for some testing. Because it's possible that along with your uh, recognized syndrome, that you could, in fact, also have a primary sleep disorder. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it would be nice if we only got one thing. But nobody promises us that. Many of us have more than one thing at the same time. So especially as we age, um, primary sleep disorders become more common. So if, in fact, your sleep is getting worse, it may be that you need to be screened. I'm also going to talk a little bit about power napping. And I actually, you know, as I said, I took all these photos. I, this was a pretty tough group of folks around this dog in Harvard Square, and I said, would you mind if I photographed your dog for a lecture? They said, yeah, OK, ma'am. Um, so I showed the picture to my uh, granddaughter, who's six, and she said, Goamma, 
Do you suppose somebody helped him on with his coat? Um, which I mean, I just loved. So yeah, here's this guy power napping in the sun. Does this look great? So we too can power nap. I'm actually a very big fan of napping. And I know Nancy earlier talked about um, my work to make health facilities a better place for patients to sleep. I'm also currently working on trying to set up nap environments for healthcare workers. 75% of nurses now have shifts of 12 hours or more. And that doesn't count their travel back and forth. So if they could even just take a 15 minute power nap, not only would this be good for their own health and well-being, there's evidence that this would decrease their, the medical errors that they might make. So that's the next thing I'm working on for, uh, for hospital environments. If you have uh, control over your environment uh, enough that you can actually take a break, a 20 to 30 minute refresher will, and there's research to show this, even makes a difference. A full sleep cycle nap would be 90 minutes. If you were gonna do a full sleep cycle, you would wanna do that early enough in the day that it's not interfering with your sleep pressure for going to sleep at an appropriate time in the evening. Does that make sense? Lots of nodding. Oh yes, that me. yes, thank you. Um, okay, so um, if, you've, if you've, especially if you've taken a full 90 minute cycle nap, you might be groggy when you wake up the way we, many of us are when we first wake up in the morning. And I believe that there's some evidence that uh, with CFIDs that um, sleep inertia can last longer in the morning. In other words, that you don't just like wake up and suddenly feel alert. And believe me, it takes many people um, 20 minutes to a half an hour to really be um, moving in the morning. So if in fact you're gonna take a long nap be aware you don't then just get up and get in your car and try to drive somewhere. You need to get through that period of sleep inertia and, and be fully awake. And if that means making sure you know, that you have fresh air, you have light, uh, you're, you know, you're walking around, you're active, um, that's the safest way to go. Finally, in addition, I wanna bring back the issue of meditation and yoga because um, these are alternative paths to add some uh, restoration to your life. And there is, again, uh, evidence of improved neurogenesis, um, uh, better preservation of your nervous system with uh, meditation and yoga. It always makes sense to anticipate and to, to be prepared for what we think we're gonna encounter in our daily life. And for those of us who are still working, this means at times, if we feel that we're driving on empty, trying to figure out whether or not we need to disclose to the appropriate parties at work what's going on. And again, you know, it's, it's very important to be aware of the kind of protections you might have from the Americans with Disabilities Act, that reasonable accommodation is appropriate for you. And that if that means you need to take a 20 minute rest break in order to be uh, doing your best job at work, then you should be able to ask for that. What else do we need in order to uh, anticipate, recognize, and adapt so that we can have uh, a work-life balance in the midst of coping with this syndrome? Social support, critical. And I'm, you know, I have to applaud this group for the support that you that you give each other, and even to people at a distance um, through what you put in your newsletters and website. A sleep diary and a journal can sometimes help with your self-awareness. You, if you're not really paying careful attention to this, you might not realize that sort of over time the amount of sleep you're getting is really insufficient, or that in fact your schedule is a lot less consistent than it should be. So keeping track of that and you can do that um, you know, just with a little written journal as you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Or you can, in fact, as I said earlier, uh, 
get an actual device and an app that reads to your iPhone and keeps a, a journal for you of how well you're sleeping. Flexibility and pacing. You know, uh, not being rigid with yourself, being forgiving, you know, recognizing there are times when you feel rested enough to take on something difficult and times when you know, it's a good time to sort the socks because it's not so challenging. Contingency planning. When is something important that needs backup and who do you have to arrange with? You've got somebody needs a ride in your family and you're set up to be the driver, but you don't feel up to it? Who can you count on? Sometimes just the power of a positive no. A lot of people think, well, if I say no, it's going to interfere with the relationship. Learning a way to say no that is respectful of yourself and respectful of the other person you know, is, is a critical skill for adapting, coping, and developing work-life balance. I'm going to talk now about actual sleep disorders. What this is is a summary of the kinds of complaints that people really give when they have a sleep disorder. They say, I can't fall asleep. I can't stay asleep. I sleep too much. I sleep at the wrong times. I move around during my sleep. I can't breathe right when I'm sleeping. If you just kept track of what seemed like the common complaints, you would begin then to see the disorders that have been identified. As I said earlier, Untreated sleep disorders may, in fact, explain or contribute to fatigue. And so they really should be carefully excluded in, as part of diagnosis. These are some of the most common of the sleep disorders. And I will review uh, some of them in a little bit more detail. Um, the insomnias and hypersomnias, that is, can't sleep, sleeping too much. Restless legs and periodic limb movement disorder. Uh, are actions that happen during sleep when they shouldn't. Um, uh, sleep apnea, there are two different types. One that is uh, governed by uh, uh, an um, obstruction of the respiratory system. The other which comes, uh, w which is a, a neurological problem. Um, parasomnias, uh, these are waking behaviors intruding into sleep time. REM sleep behavior disorder is when the shutoff valve for movement during sleep fails. And you, you know, people who sleep next to somebody with REM sleep behavior disorder will tell you periodically I get slammed during the night because he's acting out what he's dreaming. And then let's not forget that there can be uh, stresses, depression, anxiety, and particularly post-traumatic stress disorder, especially seen now in folks who are coming home uh, from Iraq who are complaining that their sleep is poor, that they're, they're, they're having nightmares, they're having in, intrusive um, uh, reenactments of bad experiences at war. So those are to be included when we think about mo what might be disturbing sleep. Along with, of course, the cat. <laughs> now, you know, this is one of my favorite slides. The sleep experts had a group of people who complained of excessive daytime sleepiness. And they went through all the studies with them, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. And then one guy said, do you think this could have anything to do with the fact that I have this old dog? And he comes in at night, and I get up, and I have to take him out, and I have to let him back in. And this happens over and over again. And then, you know, suddenly this light goes off. There are all these people whose sleep is being disturbed by pets, and no one was ever asking it as part of the screening. Now, you know, my cat, along with her other problems, had, had thyroid problems, hyperactive thyroid. So this means, you know, she's walking on you, she's meowing, you know. And I brought her into the vet, and the vet said, wow, you know, this is great. Her, her labs are just a little bit off. We never have anybody show up with a cat saying you think their thyroid is off this early. And they said, well, do they try to sleep with their cat? Because if you're, if you're sleeping with a cat who has thyroid problems, you're not getting a lot of sleep. So this is true of human beings who don't sleep well as partners, as I said earlier, dogs, other pets. This is also true 
you know, if there are other environmental disruptions, whether you're living in a dormitory, whether you're living next to the, the stop and shop uh, truck delivery site, whether the people above you in the apartment, you know, like to do Zumba in the wee hours. Let's talk about restless leg syndrome. Uh, restless leg syndrome is particularly interesting because they have now begun to really unravel the genetics behind it. And there is a, uh, uh, looking at places in the world where they find restless leg syndrome, they, oh, already, OK. Um, we we're now uh, can almost anticipate when someone comes in complaining that they feel that they're not sleeping well, get a, an idea of what their heritage is, what you discover is they, they, they may very well have this. Um, in addition, uh, restless leg syndrome has a relationship with iron stores. So sometimes people, uh, if their iron stores are improved, can be cured of restless leg. Periodic limb movement disorder is like restless leg syndrome, except instead of the legs feeling restless and the person before bed being able to report, you know, I've got this kind of tingly, weird feeling in my legs. Their legs move at night, but they don't have those kinds of complaints. Insomnia. A lot of causes for insomnia. One of them can be worries. And that's why I put the current nationwide threat level is elevated. So if you have nothing else to worry about, you can always listen to the news before you go to bed. The combination of the television and the news you know, can help you um, advance your insomnia. Obstructive sleep apnea. This is actually a much more common disorder than people are aware, uh, especially as the population ages. And you know, one of the signposts of obstructive sleep apnea is, is snoring, choking, gasping. Often a sleep partner reports this, says, you know, you're waking me up all night. Go see the doctor. Um, these folks are maybe used to how poorly they're functioning because most of the time they have no idea this is happening. They can be awakening hundreds of times a night without knowing it, falling back asleep. Oxygen level drops because the air can't get through their airways and up into their brain. So they feel like they're being choked. They wake back up. They're exhausted. They fall asleep. It happens over and over again. So there are a number of different directions for treatment of this problem. They include a machine that helps push the air down into the uh, respiratory system. And that's what you see here. Sometimes. Uh, uh, there are actual uh, structural problems with the way the jaw is organized and, and the soft tissue is, is laid in. And those can be fixed, sometimes with surgery, sometimes with a dental prosthesis. Sometimes even weight loss is enough to open up the path so the oxygen can get in. Who are these guys? These are the men from the class of 1970. And they're looking pretty chipper. But you and I know that their incidence of sleep disorders is going up. And not only that, so are theirs. Recognize any of these people? Just want to talk very briefly about screening for sleep problems. And I love this. I, I, I have noticed that the young doctors are, that the doctors are getting, in fact, younger and younger. Um, as you get older, they, they get younger. So here she is screening um, Mr. Friendly Bear to see whether or not at night he's, he's sleeping OK. Um, isn't this just the sweetest? Got to give them those doctor kits early, right? <laughs> Especially the girls. So, so what are the things that we're going to screen for? Um, now, I'm going to run through these very quickly. Um, first of all, the the different kinds of uh, problems that people have with sleep, in part, relate to uh, their life cycle stage and their their place developmentally. If we had time, I would tell you all about the complaints that adolescents have. Because adolescents tend to have a naturally later sleep cycle. And yet someone expects them to get up at 6.30 in the morning for school. This is something that should be changed. We're going to look at other things in terms of health status that might be getting in the way of your sleep. Pain, allergies that block your breathing, PTSD, weight, what medications are you taking? What special stressors might be getting in the way now? Have you just had a job loss? Have you moved? Is there an existential crisis going on? 
Is it hard to figure out if your life means anything right now with all the things you're trying to cope with? What are your personal and family sleep history issues? Sometimes we can look into a family and we discover, wow, you know, if we really look at it, mom slept very badly and she's from Norway. And Norwegians have a high, uh, high epidemiology for restless leg syndrome. So we can get some uh, evidence from looking at personal and family history. What, what can we learn about how you're, how you're actually behaving? And you might not even be aware of it. I, I had a, uh, someone come to me who said his mother was very ill. He woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning, every morning. This was an emergency room doctor, and said he starts thinking about his mother and her stroke, and he can't go back to sleep. And he's worried about this because he needs to be rested for his job. I did a little research, and what I discovered was there was a plane that flew over where he lived almost every night at 4 o'clock. So what was actually happening is, yes, the plane was waking him up. And I don't doubt that once he was awake, he started worrying about his mother. But it wasn't the worry that was waking him up. So once he put some masking in his room, he could sleep through that plane. So a little detective work often makes a big difference, especially when we talk about sleep environments. Um, we're going to ask if anyone has reported that you're snoring. And we're going to ask. Are you falling asleep while you're driving? Are you falling asleep when you're watching TV? Do you have a history of accidents or near accidents? And do you find that you're just nodding off during the day? How often does that happen? Is it just after lunch, which is quite common? Or is this, you know, first thing in the morning, you're already not able to pay attention? So where are we going from here? I don't know if you can read that. It says, eternal damnation or the snack bar. Well, we've already been to the snack bar. I don't know what that means. I guess we can go back to the snack bar. In, in fact, what we're going to do is, uh, is answer some questions. And I also want to bring your attention to some further information. And I know that on the sleep tips handout that I have given you, this uh, three-page handout, you will find uh, this website. And there's, there's lots to be learned there interesting videos from important basketball players and various exciting things about how they've dealt with their sleep problems. Um, why sleep matters, the science of sleep, and getting the sleep you need. So you'll find that, um, that URL on the. So I am going to say thank you. Um, this is the woman, uh, this is the sleeping symbol for United. It's supposed to be, you know, being on their plane is, you know, it's like being on a feather. I don't know about your plane flight experiences. Mine are not like this. Before we exit, let me look at some of these questions. What numbers are indicative of sleep apnea? And what are the numbers triggered by Medicare and Medicaid? What are the numbers triggered by? In other words, um, well, first of all, I think what I'm hearing is uh, how much do you have to be um, awakened? What's your apnea hypopnea index have to be before somebody thinks it's treatable? And uh, I think this, this depends on a number of things. First of all, it depends on who you see. Thank you. It depends on who you see. Uh, it depends on how old you are. It depends on what your symptoms are, what, what additional problems you might have that um, could be exacerbated by the apnea. I think typically young people who have a, a low apnea hypopnea index, say maybe 5 to 15, may not get treated. But as you get older, and especially if you're already suffering from something like chronic fatigue, um, uh, I find it hard to believe that if, you, if it was shown that you were um, having uh, decreased oxygenation, um, that somebody wouldn't want to at least experiment with treating uh, apnea. And I don't uh, honestly know um, what the Medicare and Medicaid um, payments are. It looks like somebody in the audience does. Five? Anything over five? Thank you. So that means five wake-ups. Same. 
Okay. So that's five wake-ups per hour. Or five wake-ups. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, the apnea hypopnea index. MMI is, oh, on, on page three of the handout, um, does the person who asked this question want to point to me what, what, provoked, what provoked this? Is there talking about the MMPI? Let's see. Ah, um, mini mental status index. In other words, you know, what's your mental state? So, does that make sense? If you're, you know, if you're, if you're uh, grief stricken, you're in an existential crisis, those are things that we would want to know about. Can you catch up on sleep on weekends? Um, lots of people do do this. And, um, you know, honestly, it's better than not catching up on sleep, right? But it's still better if you could be consistent. It will be a lot easier on your body, and it will certainly make Mondays easier if you have to get up early on Monday if you've had a consistent schedule. But of course, it's better to have as little sleep debt as possible. Sleep debt is the built up sleep that you didn't get. Unfortunately, we can't bank sleep. Because if we could, lots of us would say, well, OK, let's just sleep for a couple of months. You know, and then we can take a nice long vacation. You know, do, do whatever we want. But it doesn't work that way. And in fact, if you let your sleep, some people believe if you let your sleep debt go too long without paying it off, that you can't really pay it off fully, that there, that there will be um, physiological changes which will be hard to reverse. Um, how do you approach daytime hypersomnia? Um, well, first of all, it would be important to find out what the daytime hi hypersomnia is coming from, because there are, in fact, um, disorders, and I'm not just talking about chronic fatigue, but primary sleep disorders um, in, in which uh, a person uh, falls asleep, uh, often um, you know, even unexpectedly. Um, with, uh, uh, there, are, there are disorders where an emotional trigger, even laughing, can just knock someone to sleep. They're just, they're, you know, their their muscles uh, go weak. And some people even just collapse asleep. Um, so there are rule outs for things like narcolepsy, uh, and um, uh, anybody who is especially really sleeping. And I'm talking about not just you know dozing off because of isolation or lack of stimulation, but who's you know, really conking out during the day and also sleeping at night needs, needs a full sleep screening. You didn't mention use of medications for sleep problems. Why not? Um, well, first of all, um, I'm not an MD. I don't give prescriptions. And uh, I, I think that there is perhaps um, more hype, more advertisement about sleep medicines than is necessarily good for us. Um, the data on the number of Americans who are uh, medicating themselves to sleep and then medicating themselves awake instead of um, getting, their, uh, getting normal sleep and in a normal, in a normal cycle is alarming. Now, uh, that said, if we can begin to unravel exactly what it is that's going wrong uh, in, in CFIDs, we might be able to come up with a medication, for example, that enhances sleep spindles in stage two sleep. And if we could do that and, and test it and see whether or not there were uh, side effects that um, 
were, were not a problem, then that might be a direction we would want to go. Some of the medications, uh, people wake up, they're still tired, they get in their car, um, they're driving, they're not alert. There are cases of people getting up during the night, not even being aware of it, eating, um, going back to sleep, finding the dishes in the morning. Um, uh, some of these uh, medications are not benign. So um, these are not things that, especially if you already have some medical problems, that you make a decision to do on your own. This is something that, that uh, you decide to do in careful consultation with your primary care doctor or even better with a sleep, a sleep specialist MD. Um, do most insurance plans allow for sleep studies? Well, this is, a, this is a, a very good question. And I have to say that this is evolving right now. And some people think perhaps not in the best direction. Um, you know, in, in recent years, um, when there has been reasonable justification for it, based on history taking and uh, symptoms and the, the kinds of complaints that an individual uh, comes with during screening, there has been support for in-lab sleep testing. And that's the testing I described where you would have a full polysomnogram, which would be the EEG, the EMG, and the EOG. Then that would be read to look very carefully at your sleep architecture, to look at oxygenation during the night. That is very expensive to do. And insurance companies have uh, begun backing away from that and asking people to do home studies. Now, the home study equipment, the technology for that is advancing. And there, there are ways now with home study equipment to get better data than there used to be. And there's also you know, the additional argument that when you test someone in their own bed, you're testing the way they really sleep. So if there's night, you know, if there's a light interruption or noise, or they're sleeping with a partner, those things are going to show on their sleep study. And if they're sleeping in the lab, their sleep might not be ecologically sound, might not match their real sleep. So there's some arguments in both directions. I think if a sleep study is hard to read or suggests that there may be more serious problems when it's first done at home, that you can get your doctor to advocate to give you an in-lab study if insurance isn't covering that. What do you recommend for someone going wide awake at 3 or 4 AM? Hmm, a newspaper route? <laughs> um, um, let me just say, uh, we used to believe, or some people believe, that the way we're supposed to sleep in the United States is this eight-hour sleep period, where we don't wake up at all. But there is evidence, in fact, that in a completely natural setting, that indigenous people actually have what's known as a first sleep and a second sleep, so that they might uh, go to sleep, then wake up later, and um, uh, oftentimes share dreams, uh, dreams being um, a very important part of uh, tribal life uh, of understanding meaning, bringing people together, uh, sharing of, of symbols and hopes, and then going back to sleep for the second sleep. So if you wake up at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, it does not necessarily at all mean something as ter terrible is wrong with you. In fact, it might mean you know, that you're sleeping more naturally than some other folks. The real question is, what do you do at that time? You know, do you, you know, automatically start thinking about all the things that you have to do during the day? Or do you have some kind of um, ritual or self-calming uh, that you can do to send yourself back to sleep, assuming you didn't go to bed at 8 AM, in which case you might, in fact, be fully rested by 4 o'clock in the morning, and you might be a heavy lark, right? Someone who just likes to wake up really early and sing. But so the real question then is, if you wake up and you haven't had sufficient sleep, what kinds of things, and maybe that's what you're saying, what do you recommend? 
and whether or not uh, what's recommended is, you know, calming music or, um, or breathing exercises, um, you know, uh, well, you know, what, what are the alternatives? What helps you fall asleep at night? And can you bring some of those things back? Sometimes if you've been successful falling back asleep, if you're keeping a sleep diary, then you'll be able to look back and see what are the patterns here? Oh, well, lo and behold, Tuesday night before I went to bed, I had a chocolate bar, and then I watched TV, and then I, so sometimes you can, you know, do a little science on this and figure out what the patterns are, what might be driving um, the sleep you're experiencing. Does that make sense? Um, encourage you to be scientists. <laughs>